I can only think of two persons in the world who could bring such a crowd here, fill this hall uh, on this first cold uh, day of the season with the first snow of the season. Uh, and these are King Tut, of course, first of all. And the second is Dr. Emily Teeter, also here <laughs> present. King Tut will be introduced by Emily, all well known to you. Uh, Emily is going to leave on a uh, trip soon to Egypt, and I know there are many of you who have already traveled with Emily to Egypt, but she is soon going to lead another trip. Um, and so Emily will tell you all about Tutankhamen, King Tut, as we a bit irreverently keep calling him. Um, and um, I have the honor to introduce uh, Emily to you. So Emily, as most of you well know, uh, she is an Egyptologist. She retired from the Oriental Institute a few years ago. Uh, she was the curator of our e Egyptian collection and later coordinator of our special exhibits. And she continues to be an associate of the Oriental Institute, and I have to say that whenever I have questions about Egyptology, Emily is one of the first persons I consult. Currently, Emily is also the uh, editor of the Journal of the American Research Center in Egypt, and she is a very prolific author herself. Uh, let me give you some titles of books, monographs that she has written. Baked Clay Figurines and Votive Beds from Medina Tabel, Scarabs, Scaraboids, Seals and Seal Impressions from Medina Tabel, Egypt and the Egyptians together with Douglas Brewer, uh, of which also versions, translations into Arabic and Turkish have appeared. And most recently, she wrote the Religion and Ritual in Ancient Egypt book that was nominated for the 2012 British Archaeological Award in the category of the best archaeological book. So she is an extremely, I would say, famous author here. Um, and currently, she is writing a book on the history of the epigraphic survey. The Epigraphic Survey, as you know, is a permanent establishment uh, of the University of Chicago, of the Oriental Institute, in Luxor, and uh, they are going to celebrate their centennial in 2024. And uh, for that occasion, Emily is writing a history of the, of the entire undertaking of the Epigraphic Survey slash Chicago House. Um, Emily serves on the board of several international committees for Egyptology and Near Eastern Studies. She has also served as the president of RC, the American Research Center in Egypt, and she continues to promote the Chicago chapter of RC. Specifically about King Tut, Emily has a long association with him. Um, she served as an assistant uh, for the, the big blockbuster show uh, that was sponsored by the Oriental Institute and the Field Museum in 1977. And then she was a project Egyptologist for the show uh, when it moved to Seattle in, a year later in 78. And then again she was consultant for the uh, blockbuster show in San Francisco. She has published several articles about the objects from the tomb and spoken widely about what the tomb reveals about technology, religion, and Tut's impact on museology. So I'm th I think we are all in for a real treat, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Emily Teeter here to the podium. What I want to talk about tonight is, uh, briefly, is why Tut matters. You know, the discovery of King Tut's tomb is one of the greatest archaeological finds ever, not just from Egypt. Of course, I'm an Egyptologist, and so I'm very, you know, pro-Egypt. Uh, pro but opening the door of the tomb in 1922 was like opening a door that revealed so much about the ancient culture and its people. But it's important to remember that the tomb of King Tutankhamun and the objects in that tomb still have a lasting impact today. Um, Partially, well, why should we care? 
partially because the great number of objects, and we're all familiar with seeing some of these objects, what they tell us, um, the objects in this tomb, over 5,000 of them, provided a snapshot of life in about the year 1300 BC. For example, an idea of what the g glamour and splendor of the court was during that time. Here, one of the thrones of Tutankhamun, his scepters, and then, of course, the very famous mask. The sheer wealth of Egypt in the time of Tut is reflected by the number of objects and the sheer duplication of some of these. For example, here in the antechamber of the tomb, some of the six gold-covered chariots. So tremendous numbers of duplicates of things crammed into this very small tomb. Um, the jewelry, just hundreds and hundreds of pieces of jewelry. Here you can see uh, the cartouche-shaped box, which is about two feet long, it's large, and then a view of it uh, on the right showing you the number of pieces of jewelry that were just stuffed inside this box and a detail of one set of the earrings in the lower left with very important technologically with these uh, blue glass heads. But again, the number of objects, the splendor of these things was unbelievable. And again, the body of the king, each arm was covered with different bracelets. So the sheer number and variety of artifacts was astounding. And again, things like statues, uh, many, many duplicates and many, many different types. The tomb and the objects tell us a lot about types of objects because some of these objects that were discovered in 1922 were, an own, were known only from fragmentary examples from other royal tombs discovered before the time of, of 1922. So for example, there were a number of these fragmentary large statues from the tomb of uh, Amenhotep II and Thutmose III and Horemheb. But as you can see, they're not very well preserved. But in the tomb of King Tutankhamun, we had what they were supposed to look like, beautifully preserved. So in fact, there were two different types of statues which were not preserved in their entirety in the fragmentary example. So we know more about what these statues represented. They were guardians of the king. One is a living king and one is a dead king. Again, we wouldn't be able to understand the fragmentary objects without the Tut objects. Or here, examples of fragmentary statues from the tomb of Thutmose of the third and Thutmose of the fourth and Horemheb. And again, what are these about? Well, in 1922, we found out what these are about. This are what those leopards are from. Or for example, um, a fragmentary statue of Anubis on the upper left uh, from um, Tomb of Horemheb, and the context was lost because it was only the statue of Anubis, but King Tutankhamun's example on the right shows us exactly what the function of this large statue of Anubis, the guardian of the underworld, Imute, was all about. He was a guardian of a shrine. And another example here, a very fragmentary section of a, uh, of a wood carving from the tomb of Horemheb and the example from King Tutankhamun, and then to give you the overall context. So this is what that fragmentary tomb a head from the tomb of Horemheb actually belonged to. So again, we're, it suddenly was giving us a much broader idea of what much of this fragmentary material was about. Now it's also very interesting that among the tomb's objects were objects that were completely unknown until 1922 and later as the tomb was being, was being cleared. Things like this these incredible calcite Egyptian alabaster statues. The one on the left is about two feet tall. And nobody had seen anything like this from ancient Egypt. Absolutely no precedent whatsoever, not even in two dimensions. It also was a very interesting reflection on uh, the lifestyle and the taste during the time of King Tutankhamun because, I mean, it was certainly Egyptian Baroque during this period. You know, everything was very ornamented. Um, this was an extremely wealthy period in Egypt's history, and you can see this reflected in the objects. Things are very heavily ornamented, the best materials used. Um, nothing is very plain. Even plain things are decorated in subtle ways. Um, the one on the right is still, there's so much discussion of what this thing on the right is. Is it a flower arranger? Because it has a basin, but what are the figures symbolizing? So there are all of these types of objects that have, that have uh, stimulated a tremendous amount of discussion because we just don't know what these things are about or for. Or another good example is this statue which is referred to as the mannequin. No clue what this is. There is one 
parallel from the Old Kingdom. But again, some of these things are so unique that we simply still cannot interpret them. The uh, treasures also tell us a lot about trade in about the time of Tutankhamun through the incorporation of materials which are not indigenous, well, are not, they are indigenous to Egypt, but they're primarily being traded in. For example, the gold. When you think about Tutankhamun, you think gold. Um, for example, the innermost coffin is 125 kilos, I think, of, of 22 karat gold. So we're talking about huge amounts of gold. And as you've seen photographs, the, the, the wooden furniture is sheathed in gold, gold jewelry. This is because of Egypt's domination of Nubia. And this is an image of a tomb contemporary with Tutankhamun. It's of one of his officials, and it shows Nubian envoys coming, presenting gold rings. In the middle, you can see uh, gold rings on a, on a tray. So this gold that enriched the time of Tutankhamun and shows up in the tomb is from Nubia. It is from trade with Nubia. It's actually coerced trade with Nubia because Egypt is dominating both politically and economically the lands to the south during this period. And again, this trade with Nubia is very important for the splendor of Egyptian objects during this time. Here, a spectacular and really pretty whimsical uh, stool done in ebony and ivory in imitation of a bovine skin. But again, ebony and ivory, very, very definite uh, imports from Nubia. And ivory, again, being used in just unknown of uh, amounts, because also, again, the preservation of the Tutankhamun, object, Tutankhamun objects is so good, it gives us a much better idea of the types of objects that might have been in a palace during the New Kingdom. Here, a wooden box completely sheathed in sheets of ivory. And then also other materials, for example, a small vessel in the form of a pomegranate in silver. Silver is not common in Egypt, and so again, this is material that's being traded in that gives us an idea of the relations of Egypt with the surrounding areas during this time. It also tells us about not only contact with Egypt's neighbors, but also with taste during this time. As I said, the Egyptian material is really over the top, frou-frou, baroque, um, in, you know, incredible, incredible. Um, but then you see things like this. These are two views of the same dagger with the reverse of the sheath. And this is um, a, not only a lot of gold, but also it shows the taste during this, this uh, period. You can see the, the sheath, the view to the right, is a very Mesopotamian-influenced design. It is not Egyptian by any means. And so with the tomb of Tutankhamun, we see a lot of foreign influence in the design. And we also see some te techniques. For example, the granulation on the handle of the dagger is also thought to be uh, from Syria or Mesopotamia. Another good example here is a spectacular calcite vessel, which has been in Chicago several times for the touch shows. So some of you may have actually seen this piece. And the drum, this is an this is an unguent container. This is a good example. Instead of just a nice vessel for unguents during the time of Tutankhamun, it becomes incredibly ornate. And so you have a, a cylindrical vessel, and on the top, a uh, calcite figure of the king. It's king as a lion. The name of the king is on it. But the decoration on the drum of the vessel is completely non-Egyptian, again, drawn from this international style, which you could see very clearly in our galleries in the Megiddo ivories. So during this period, the Egyptians are reaching out for cultural inspiration to, uh, to Western Asia, whether they are Western Asiatic craftsmen in Egypt or if it's just Egyptians working in that style, we simply don't know. Another example here, this wonderful kid-sized chair, uh, because Tutankhamun came to the throne, obviously, when very young, eight or nine, so we have child-sized materials and then adult-sized. And the arms of this also with the guillotine patterns around and the, the ibex looking over his back, again, very non-Egyptian, an indication of the tastes during this period looking toward Western Asiatic uh, patterns for, for luxury items. Another thing that I find very interesting, which is typical of the time of Tutankhamun and shown over and over again with the objects from his tomb, is this craze 
for motto jewelry. You know, now it's become kind of popular for people to have like their name, maybe name written in script on a little chain around their neck. Very popular in Egypt, you see this with Arabic. And, and, but Tut, a lot of his jewelry actually spells out his name. Uh, the name is written with a, uh, you can see the one on the left is a little easier to see. You can see the round disc, the sun disc, and then the blue beetle. And then there's usually a half circle, or you can see it on the, on the straps. And that spells out his throne name, Nebkeperu Ray. The same thing with the bracelet on the right. And so during this period, there's this odd thing that we don't really see in other great, uh, well-preserved groups of jewelry, of personalized jewelry, things that are made with Tut's own name, which seems to be something specific perhaps to his own desires and own sense of taste. Now, another thing that is very, very important about the material in the tomb and why it matters is what it tells us about technology during this period. Because a good look, good careful look at some of this material, and a lot of this material is still being studied today, tells us a tremendous amount about technology. For example, these spectacular canopic coffins, one of four in the tomb, these were of course used for the embalmed viscera. And looking at the way these are made is absolutely fascinating. Uh, it is a gold shell that, is be that has been beaten over a form, and then it, it, there are pieces of gold wire that have been soldered to the gold shell, and then stone and glass inlays cut Probably a lot of these cut as bar, um, cast as bars and then cut into little slices. Now, a thing that's very interesting is um, recently, with the move of a lot of this material from the Egyptian Museum in Tahrir Square to GEM, to the new spectacular museum that's going to open probably next year, it's been one of the few times that a lot of this material has really been more carefully studied. Um, because it is so unique and so valuable, generally studies have been done through a museum case, which is not the way you really, you know, if you want to figure out how something is made, you don't do it that way. But it's just, it is such high security that it was not possible until now. And so the conservators at GEM are doing a lot of very interesting work with magnification. So a lot of these things, like how did they make this? Once you have them under appropriate conditions where you could actually see them with a, even a low power microscope, that it, it's really revolutionizing what we knew about how craftsmen were working in ancient Egypt. Also inlay technique like this, I mean, just really spectacular workmanship during the time of Tut with uh, working with both glass and stone inlay. And at one time people were saying, well, glass, eh, you know, it's not real. It's not real carnelian. It's not real turquoise. But the Egyptians, uh, glass became common about the a little before the time of Tutankhamun, and the Egyptians loved colored glass because it had that same deep color that, that semi-precious stone, what we call semi-precious stone has. They actually called glass stone that flows. And so glass was as precious, really, as some of these what we call semi-precious stones. And so you can see the combination of these different materials. Um, and just when you look at this, you think you know, the amount of time that goes into making any one of these pieces is absolutely staggering. For example, this pectoral, you can see the, the links on the band that leads to the uh, counterpoise behind. Each one of those has a tremendous amount of work in inlay. So um, the Egyptian craftsmen were absolute masters. Another piece that is of particular interest is this, another pectoral from the tomb that for many years was thought to be true enameling and this is something where actually my own research was able to show that it is not enameled. It is, again, cloisons made by uh, soldering gold wire onto the gold back. And the red part of the wings, you can see, is actually in a then undocumented, previously undocumented technique of introducing colored resin into the cloisons and then smoothing it off, which makes sense because you look at a lot of this and you say, I, the Egyptian craftsmen were so, you know, they spent so much time on everything. But if they could figure out ways to speed up the process, they would. And I think this use of the colored resins is uh, uh, something they're experimenting with because it gave the appearance of extremely close fitting 
inlays. And here's a close-up of that to give you an idea of the workmanship. Other objects with technology, as I mentioned, glass becomes uh, much more prominent in Egypt in, in the 18th dynasty, after the, the reign of um, Akhenaten, his pr perhaps father. And so we see some incredible examples of glass working, considering that this material was still relatively new. This is a cast glass headrest. It's a huge chunk of blue glass, and this is a super, super luxury object. And again, you can see how elegant it is, but the Egyptian craftsmen during this period, they just couldn't help themselves. So they wrapped the, they wrapped the edges in gold foil, just to like tart it up a little bit more. Now, it is interesting what all the tomb tells us that it, you could be disappointed in that it did not settle a number of issues which are still plaguing Egyptology, one of the most important being the parentage of King Tutankhamun. The genealogy of this period is very, very complicated, and every time a new book is written, it gets more complicated. Uh, part of the problem is we have a, a known set of what we consider to be facts, and those facts can be connected in different ways to create one scenario, but they can be connected in a different way to create a different scenario. So the Amarna period, the, the pre-Tut period, and Tut's reign itself is really uh, subject to a lot of scrutiny because there are so many things that are known. So people were very disappointed that there wasn't like a letter from his dad in the tomb. You know, they would say, you know, dear Tut, and so, oh, we, we know who his father is. Um, so there was very little overt, specific, historical material in the tomb. There are reused objects. We do have pottery and stone vessels with names of his ancestors, but it doesn't really help tell us how they tie into the family tree. But uh, although there's not a lot of distinct historical information, there is a very, very interesting bunch of information about the time of Tut and why he is such an important king. Now, this is not from his tomb. This is the um, restoration stela that was discovered at Karnak in 1905. Now, most of you know something about Tut. If you remember before Tut, we have the Amarna period, Akhenaten, who changes from the polytheistic system to a not really monotheistic system, but eh, well, so the worship of a single god, the Aten, but the uh, pantheon also includes the king, by the way, so it's not really a monotheism. Um, and so then Tutankhamun, in probably about the fifth year of his reign, he turns away from that Amarna religion and restores the old polytheistic religion. And that's what is related on this uh, stela, which was discovered um, you know, 20 years before the tomb was. Um, but it's very interesting to see that there are some objects in the tomb give us an idea that Tut was very involved with this return to orthodoxy. And there are subtle um, hints about what was going during this time. For example, in the tomb were four enormous gold-covered shrines that surrounded the sarcophagus. And on the inside back of this one, the first one, is the first example of a very important religious text called the Book of the Heavenly Cow. This does not exist before Tut. And so there are very interesting reevaluations of the old Orthodox religion going on in the reign of Tutankhamun that are very important for our understanding of what was going on. This is a wonderful story. So this is the Heavenly Cow. And the story basically says that mankind and the gods are living together in the same realm which is kind of interesting. You don't get that in a lot of ancient uh, cosmologies. But then uh, mankind became sort of nasty and started to plot against the god Re, the, the sun god Re or Ra. And um, so the gods decided to uh, kill, kill mankind because they were not obeying gods and they were not good, good for, the, for the earth. And so uh, as they rebel against Ray, Ray sends his daughter Hathor to kill, to kill all of mankind, just get rid of them and all. And then the gods start saying, ooh, this is not really a good idea. We need people. And so uh, they, you'll hear this in many different forms, but this is the earliest form. And so the gods distract Hathor by having her drink a lot of red beer, which he thinks is the blood 
of mankind. So she's wallowing in the blood of all these people she's killing. But of course, what she's doing, she's getting drunk. The Egyptians love to drink, by the way. And she like falls asleep. And so then Ray withdraws to heaven. And what this shows is the separation, as a result of that, the separation of the realms of the god, the gods and humans. And this it happens in the reign of Tutankhamun. So this is a major reevaluation of the cosmology of Egypt. Now, this is called the Eye of Ray. There are a lot of, you'll hear other uh, versions of this where it's Sekhmet who gets drunk on beer. There, but this is the earliest version with Hathor. So it also is the beginning of, of uh, the two sort of senses of time, the Nehet, uh, Nehe and Jet time, which are continuous and cyclic time. So there's a lot brewing in these early years of King Tutankhamun that's not usually acknowledged. It's another reason why Tut matters. Now, the second shrine has extremely interesting texts on it also. Um, on this text, there are texts which are unique, not known before Tut whatsoever. And the thing that's extremely interesting is the dedication text for this says that Tutankhamun himself did this for his father, Ray. So he is taking credit for this new cosmology that he is presenting shown here. So on the right, you have a, a god, a mummiform god. He is called um, he who hides the hours. And what we're seeing in this on the right, on the left, is also the separation of, of the, or the, the articulation of what happens to the sun at night. Because it was a little bit unclear, but during these very early texts, these enigmatic texts from the tomb of Tutankhamun, what we have is this, we see the sun goes down into the darkness of the night and is then recharged. And the thing that's very interesting is it's shown as a sun disk, not a lunar disk. So this is a completely different thing than had been going on before. So what we see on the left are arms that keep the disk of the sun in motion. And then the ba, you can see there's a, a, a figure of, of a ba, of a, of actually here with a, uh, uh, a ram-headed ba. And so this is, and also you have on the right, you have the snake with its tail in its mouth the Orobos, and this is the first example of this in ancient Egyptian iconography. So again, there's a lot going on with this. So we didn't get anything about who the family was, but we get a lot about the reconfiguration of the ancient Egyptian religious system. Um, by the way, John Darnell, who's a graduate of the University of Chicago, wrote his dissertation on these underworld books, a very, very important work. Okay, so let's turn to why Tut matters today. Um, the tomb, of course, was discovered in 1922, and it was a very welcome distraction from world politics. Remember, it had not been that long since the end of World War I, it took many years for World War I to get settled out, and heading into the 1926 Depression, so it could be more distracting and cheering than a teenage pharaoh's tomb crammed with treasure. And so Tut and his Egypt became complete design icons. And I know you've seen some of this. I mean, it's, there's an endless supply of this wonderful, old, you know, crazy stuff with, uh, with Tut. Old King Tut was a wise old nut. There's a whole bunch of this, of this music. Or, so Tut was being used for everything. It was a Tut craze. You've heard this, you know, Tut mania, which is still around today, as you know. But Tut's uh, name, and the, the sort of logo of Tut, the gold mask, started sh turning up in just places completely incongruous. And that's because King Tut was such a recognized brand and name that was, using to, was used to sell everything. Like, why not King Tut lemons? You know, fine. Or why not Egyptian singer sewing machines? Now, one of the most lasting impacts of Tut really is the way the discovery of the tomb in 1922 changed archaeology. And this gets a little bit more somber, but extremely important for why Tut matters. Uh, in the late 19th century, the Servus d'Antiquides, which was the uh, part of the government, the Egyptian government that oversaw all archaeology, had reserved all sites in Egypt for the government to excavate. And they had established in 1963 the Bulak Museum, which is in near where the, um, 
the Tahrir Museum is, and that was to be the repository for all the artifacts that were excavated in Egypt. Um, generally, at the turn of the century, the turn of the 19th century, the situation was, although the laws said that all objects excavated in Egypt stayed in Egypt, Maspero, who was the head of the antiquities organization, made many, many exceptions. Generally, the situation was that duplicates or objects not wanted or needed by the Bulak Museum or other museums could be given to the excavators. It wasn't a right, but they might be given to the excavators, and this became known as a division. So generally, over the years, what happened is that foreign excavators would work in Egypt under the aegis of the Service d'Antiquité, and when they found things, at the end of the excavation, the Egyptian officials would come and take what they needed for the national collections, and then they would let the excavators take everything else with them. And that generally, although it was not following the law, that's what was being done. And so when Carter and Carnarvon found the tomb of Tutankhamun, they had pretty good expectations that if they found a tomb, they would probably be able to take some of those objects with them. And there were some very good reasons for believing that. For example, in 1913, there was a spectacular group of royal jewelry found at, at, um, at Lahun, which is south of Cairo. And in this case, for example, the, the Egyptians kept this fabulous crown of, of Princess Sit Hathor unit and other types of things. But for example, the Metropolitan was given things like this, absolutely spectacular objects, really the core of some of the best of the Middle Kingdom jewelry was, it was actually given to the excavator who was Flinders Petrie, who then sold it to the Metropolitan Museum. So what I'm trying to say is, although the law said everything should stay in Egypt, there were generally accepted exceptions being implemented by the Egyptian government. And this is where Tut really comes into its fore and makes a big difference. So Carter and Carnarvon start working the Valley of the Kings much before the time they discovered King Tutankhamun. You probably know this story, you know, many uh, unfruitful seasons. The last season, Carnarvon, shown on the left, says that he's not gonna fund the excavations anymore and Carter says, oh please, one last season. And of course, the last scheduled the day of the excavation, the last season, boom, they find the tomb. Another why this, reason why the storyline is so fabulous. I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. It's just, it's got it all. Um, now their contract, Carter and Carnarvon's contract with the government said, as it does, for other excavators, that if a tomb was intact, whether it was royal or non-royal, but they were working the Valley of the Kings, if it was intact, all objects would stay in Egypt undivided, which would make sense, so that the, they could keep everything together for the context of what the contents of a royal tomb was. Um, and also because of the historic in, uh, historical importance. But the contract said that if the tomb was not intact, if it had been robbed, then the government would consider sharing the contents of the tomb with the excavators. Okay, well, first of all, a problem is, what if the tomb was robbed about 15 years after it was, after it was sealed? Does that make it intact or does that make it robbed? And there is no precedent for this. And of course, the Egyptian government is saying, no, 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 this is an intact tomb. And the Carnarvon estate is saying, no, 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 this is a robbed tomb, and as a result, we should have a division. Well, colossally bad timing for Carter and Carnarvon, because the discovery of the tomb coincided with the dramatic rise in Egyptian nationalism as the Egyptians were trying to expel the British, and the, uh, the rise of the idea that Egyptians should re be responsible for their own cultural heritage. And by this time, the Egyptians were really getting very fatigued with the neo-colonial attitude of the Germans, French, the Americans to a lesser de degree, um, just assuming that they could do what they wanted in Egypt. And so the laws that were on the book started to be enforced more fully, part particularly by this man who's shown on the right, Pierre Lacot, who is French, but he was the head of the antiquities organization. And he was uh, under pressure not to compromise on the laws, and he also personally felt very strongly about this. And uh, there's a little thing in the, in the recent news and notes where I talk about Lacot and his contributions to modern antiquities laws. So 
big problem. So there's a big fight between the Egyptian government and Carter and Carnarvon over things like publicity. You saw that film, that little film. That was a, re a result of that, the surreptitious filming. But also the, uh, the idea of if there would be a division and also just little things. Uh, Howard Carter could be very, very testy. Uh, by 1924, it was so bitter between the Egyptian government and Carter that the Egyptians uh, changed the locks on the tomb and basically told Carter he had no more right to work in the tomb. And it's a weird thing because the Egyptian government actually asked James Henry Breasted, our Breasted, if he wanted to work on the tomb, and Breasted said, uh, no, no, I'm not, not going to do that. Um, so what happened, as you might expect, is this went to the courts. And for over a year, there were legal argument, arguments on both sides. What was appropriate? Was it an intact tomb? Was it a robbed tomb? What should happen to the objects? Lacoe de declared that foreign missions, quote, had no rights over this material. And in fact, that's what happened. But in the meantime, a lot of people got involved in this. Our, our founder, James Henry Breasted, was brought in as a mediator uh, to try to make peace between, to find a compromise between the Carnarvon estate and the Egyptian government. And to no avail, he tried, but uh, Breasted describes being, quote, kicked by both sides, and he withdrew. He said, it's, this is not, not uh, productive. But by January 1925, Carter and the Carnarvon estate, Carnarvon had died in the meantime, received a new permission to excavate, called a concession from the Egyptian government. And in fact, it did confirm that all the objects from the tomb would stay in Egypt, but that the Carnarvon estate would be compensated for the expenses of the excavation. So this is why Tut matters. This marked a major change in antiquities laws in Egypt about what objects left Egypt. The discovery of this tomb had a major impact on the impact on the move toward strict divisions, stricter, smaller divisions, and eventually the end of the practice of the Egyptian antiquities organization allowing any objects to go out of the country, uh, which started to be implemented more in the 1950s. And of course, this was an issue for us. We discovered the two statues thought to be King Tutankhamun in 1930, right in the middle of all of this acrimony between the Carnarvon estate and the Egyptian government. Uh, but the Egyptian government did very graciously give one, we excavated two statues of thought to be Tutankhamun. I think they are Tutankhamun, I'll say that. And uh, they very graciously gave us one to bring back to Chicago that you saw in the galleries tonight. It was discovered in uh, December 1930. So this, in turn, has changed how museums obtain objects. Fewer are from excavations. More are, unfortunately, from the art market. Some of the things from the art market are from excavations that have gone from museums into the art market. But primarily, a lot of things in museums are loans from other museums as the regulations have been tightened. What I want to look at now is how museums, um, how Tut has changed how museums operate in more recent years and the impact that Tutankhamun has had. And, you know, I think we probably all go to museums. And you may not really recognize that many of the museum policies and what we see when we go to museum shows is the result of the discovery of, the king, of king Tutankhamun's tomb. So, um, so looking at the 1940s and 50s, there was not a lot of interest in ancient Egypt, which is kind of interesting. So after all the Tut mania in the 40s, 40s and 50s, it just sort of fell out of fashion. Collections were pulled off view. There were a lot of discussions whether uh, ancient Egyptian art was fine art, so, so, for example, at the Art Institute, it was pulled, most of it was pulled off display. Metropolitan Museum started selling a lot of their artifacts because it was the director said, "This is not fine. This is not art. This is artifact." So, and all these discussions whether ancient Egyptian art should be shown with classical material because of the, of the chronology and the geography, or if it should be shown with African material, sub-Saharan African material because of, uh, because of, ge of geography. So lots and lots of different things going on. But there was, in 1960, there was a new realization that Tut was very, very important for museums, in spite of it, a lot of the Egyptian material being relegated to basements. And in fact, in the, in the 50s, most of the holdings, the Egyptian collection from the Art Institute was here in the basement of the Oriental Institute. 
And at one point, the Field Museum was going to give us all of their material because they decided they didn't want Egyptian either. It gives you an idea of how the pendulum swings back and forth on what's... So as a museum curator, the best thing to do is you don't get rid of anything. <laughs> because 15, 20 years later, you could really regret it. So go ahead to 1960. And in 1960s was the uh, international appeal to safeguard the monuments of Nubia. This was spearheaded by UNESCO, a project to save the monuments of Nubia. Because if you recall, there was a new high dam being built at Aswan. And it was going, the water that, uh, that in this, behind the uh, Lake Nasser, well, Lake Nasser that was being created by the dam, was going to inundate dozens and dozens of ancient Egyptian and Nubian temples. And the one that really got people's attention, of course, was Abu Simbel, you know, this spectacular monument here shown in the process of being moved. So it was suggested that a, um, UNESCO was looking for ways to fund the, uh, the, the salvage project, how to get money to move these temples, to safeguard these temples. So there was an idea. UNESCO suggested that a general collection of Egyptian artifacts from the Egyptian Museum could tour the United States and could be a, a money, a fundraiser. So people would come see this material, appreciate this fabulous material, and support the uh, Nubian salvage campaign. But it's very interesting because John Wilson, who is, was a former director of the Oriental Institute and very prominent Egyptologist here at the Oriental Institute, um, was very involved in the Nubian salvage project, and he recalled we persuaded the Minister of Culture of Egypt that American museums already had objects fully as good as those offered. For example, so you're going to send stuff to show at the Metropolitan when the Metropolitan has stuff that's maybe better than what's coming from Egypt? So th that the exhibit would have no exceptional appeal. We asked for a selection of objects from the tomb of Tutankhamun, a name that would attract the public. Dr. Okasha, who is the Minister of Culture, was dubious because nothing from that famous tomb had ever left Egypt. But uh, John Wilson and the UNESCO group were, uh, worked with the Egyptian government. And in 1961 to 1963, a group of 34 objects from the tomb of Tutankhamun, which had never left Egypt before, toured the United States, opening in Washington, D.C., November 3rd, 1961. It visited 16 museums between 1961 and 1963. Who in the audience saw that show? Okay, Jim? So, yeah, and a, cu a couple people, a couple people. Now, and it continued to four cities in, in Canada. Now, why this is important? Okay, in Chicago, it was here at the Field Museum for one month and it attracted 123,000 people in one month. And over the whole US tour, it attracted 1.3 million. Now these, you'd say, well, not huge numbers, but in the 1960s, these were enormous numbers. Because back then, museums were very white glove. You know, it was like ladies auxiliaries, and it was either bohemian or, you know, white glove set that was going to museums. So for the, for the museum directors to see 123 people coming to the Field Museum to see this material from the King Tut's tomb got the attention of the museum directors. They realized, hmm, there's something to this we need to consider. So it got the museum director's attention. It was a real wake up to museums uh, about financing and also political relations and public relations with this Tut material. Then skip forward a little bit. There started to be some touch shows that drew enormous crowds, and you saw some stills from some of them in the, in the slides we're looking at, especially from, from uh, London in 1972. There were early touch shows in Tokyo, 1965, Paris, 67, London, 72, and Moscow in 74. And these drew enormous crowds. And this really got the museum world thinking, oh, you know, this has gotten more people in our museum than anything ever before. So, in 1976, the United States gets their own tour. This is the Treasures of King Tutankhamun. It opened at the National Gallery in 1976. Who here saw that show? Oh, yeah, quite a, quite a few people. Yeah, not that long ago. When it came to the United States, it was a complete revelation for US museums and museum administrators. Thomas Hoving, who was at the Met at that time, 
wrote, the exhibit caused a sensation and became perhaps the ultimate blockbuster. This is the first time blockbuster, which is a, an armament, had been applied to a museum exhibit, causing thousands of people to visit an art museum who never thought of it before. That was getting the museum director's attention. Now, this, this, this show was very different than the later ones. This show in 1976, which came to Chicago in 1977, was unlike any other show, and it is why Tut matters, because this changed the way American museums work. This show was planned at the highest diplomatic levels. It was envisioned as being, quote, a part of the Middle East peace process which would affect the future relationship of Egypt and the US. In other words, this is not a museum to museum show, this is a government to government show. Suddenly, the governments are understanding what role artifacts, particularly Tut, have in politics. So this whole idea that this Tut show was inspired and motivated by really the post-war, Cold War mentality. If you remember, when Egypt is building the high dam, First, the Russians are building the high dam. US had bid on the project, lost out to the Russians. Uh, the Americans were very cranky about it because they didn't want to have more Soviet uh, influence in Africa. And the USA was very eager to get back in the good graces of Egypt. So the Americans started to decide, OK, we're going to have our touch show, but we're going to have one upman, Russia. We want more than what Russia had. So our, our show, was in, it had 50 objects of 55 objects which symbolized the 55 years since the discovery of the tomb. And, oh gosh, the Russian show only had 50 objects. Um, in fact, it was Nixon with his advisors demanded more pieces and more cities for the US show. The Russian show only had three cities, and we had six and eventually seven. And so we got 55 objects instead of 50. Now, in spite of the blatant political maneuvering, the show was publicized as a cultural exchange. But the political nature of the show is underscored by the fact that it opened in the nation's capital in 1976, by Centennial, at the National Gallery in DC. So there's a lot of American politics going on here. But the thing that's most in interesting about this, the joint agreement for the show. Now these shows today are, are usually designed, uh, signed by, for example, the head of the Field Museum and the head of either a tour package, or we'll get to, or the head of the Antiquities Organization. This sh the agreement for the show was signed by Nixon and Sadat. This is not your normal art show. In, so in October 28, 1975, an agreement was signed by the Egyptian Foreign Minister, uh, Ismail Fahmi, and Henry Kissinger. So again, this was envisioned as a quasi-official diplomatic agreement that was destined to be more than an arts show, sort of masquerading as an arts show. Now, the most important outcome of this that continued to be absolutely crucial to big museum shows, and I'm going to say it again, this is why Tut matters, is in 1976, January 19, the uh, federal government passed the Arts and Artifacts Indemnification Act. This was government insurance for the objects from, the King, from King Tut's tomb. When the objects were agreed upon, there was not an insurance agent in the world that would insure, even the mask, remember, was, you know, what's the mask worth? Um, there was nobody who would insure this thing. And so the government stepped in and they self-insured this. This uh, Arts and Artifacts Indemnification Act has what passed for Tut has then made possible for all of these big loan shows, like the Treasures of the Vatican, the Monet shows, all of the shows that are coming from overseas are operating under the Arts and Indemnifications Act passed by Turan, for, for Turan Common. Um, here at the Oriental Institute, we had a, a, sh a show several years ago, quite a few years ago, on, on um, Old Cairo, and we were borrowing piece, and we had to get Arts and arts Indemnification for that. So it, it's, it works even with smaller museums. Now, very interesting also, the 1976 show had, was supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Robert Wood Johnson Charitable Trust, and Exxon, the oil company. Very interesting. Exxon gained so much exposure and goodwill for so little money that they spent that it set off a new trend of businesses collaborating with not for profit institutions like museums to promote their own companies through art. Now, Exxon is not selling gasoline in this show, but they put 
it was only like less than $200,000. And they produced all of this educational material, even all the official letterhead for all the cities said, you know, presented by Exxon. And Exxon, um, after the fact, there were reports from Exxon, they thought, you know, this is like the best deal we ever got in the world for promoting Exxon. So this set a whole new precedent for how businesses get involved with promoting uh, art with not-for-profit organizations. Now the Touch Show in the 1976, 76 here, the poster for the OI Field Museum presentation, also brought other innovations. For example, evening viewing hours. We take this for granted now, right? You can go to a, museum, a big popular show, you can buy an evening. Well, this is all because of Tut, because the contracts for the Tut show said, uh, this drove the museum directors into like conniptions, but they said you cannot charge extra for the Tut show. You can charge for your museum, but you can't charge extra for the Tut show. So the museums thought, okay, those are the operating hours, but if we show the show after operating hours, we can charge. And so this was a huge revenue stream for the museums because they couldn't charge for the touch show. So that has stuck with us. Gift shops. There have always been gift shops, but Turangaman really blew the top off the gift shop uh, phenomena. And some of you might even have some of these objects, you know, kicking around your jewelry box. Um, again, very weird contracts with this. The Metropolitan Museum sent mount makers to Egypt they made very beautiful replicas, and in the craziest contract ever, they were allowed rights to sell this in perpetuity. You know, what kind of lawyer did they have? Uh, and so a lot of this stuff, I've noticed a lot of this stuff has showed up in this, Christmas's, this season's Christmas catalog for the Met. They're showing it again. But so there were official gift shops where you could only buy the Met stuff, but, and of course the museums couldn't make money off that, so they had their own unofficial gift shops and they could sell whatever they wanted, like canisters, you know, bourbon in the form of Tut's mask. Uh, I, I forgot to put in a picture, one of my favorite things was like a Frisbee with a Turankaman mask on it, you know, Tut on anything. It didn't, it was just hilarious. And this still goes on, like this is, it's like, I'm not sure what these things are in the middle, but they um, allude to Tut. And part of this, of the gift shop phenomena got so, got so popular. Do you remember there was a company called the Museum Shop that the beautiful replicas of things, that it became such, a, take, people were taking so granted that museum gift shops were a place to buy stuff because of the tough phenomena, that the museum shop was a separate company. It had nothing to do with muse museums. You didn't have to go to a museum. You could just buy museum stuff in the shop. So. Now, another thing that's very important with the Tut thing is before the big Tut shows, shows were generally presented in a fairly sober manner. But with Tut, you got the dark entry to the tomb and the photo murals and the spooky music, you know, the kind of reedy music that's supposed to be ancient Egyptian. I'm not sure how that works, but, and, um, you know, very dramatic. That is because of Tut, and now we don't think anything of it. But that was a new phenomenon during Tut, setting a very immersive sort of experience. And now, you know, we don't think about it. We go to a show like this, and it's like, well, where are the objects? You can barely see them for the, for the installation. So this brings us to, briefly to a new legacy of Turankam, the financial expectations of museums and how potential blockbuster shows are being packaged and sold to the public. Uh, it's clear that Egypt sells. When the Egyptian government again started to approve loans, it was very clear that it was done with a reasonable expectation of financial gain to support museums and excavation sites. But as what has happened is that, it, I think this is a little opinionated here, is that a monster has been created in the form of a new intermediary between, for example, the French government or the Egyptian government and, the, and museums in these museum exhibit packagers. Now, these are companies who just create an exhibit, and then they market it to uh, different museums. There's no input from the museums. The museums can sign on the line and take it or not. It's, uh, if you take the show, the semis pull up, you've got a show, poof, in your galleries, and, and that's it. So it's, it's very good for museums that have no staff. This is also why we're seeing more and more of these big shows in exhibit spaces, not in museums. 
but this has some problems. For example, the New York Commissioner of Cultural Affairs in 2004 was quoted, this is with 2004 when we started having the two touch shows circulating, which is kind of weird. To some extent, it is a brave new world. It used to be that museums themselves developed content exclusively, and now organizations with a more commercial mindset are trying to package content. The point is, the big difference I see is that these package shows have very little educational content. They do not have ancillary educational programs. They really don't care. They want you to come in and pay for the ticket and see the show. Some of these shows are spectacular, but it's a very different thing. It is art for profit. It is not art on the old sense of how museums used to operate. We saw a very similar thing with the Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs, which um, was in Chicago in May 2006. Very, very, very good show. It was organized by people in Basel, and then it got to the United States, and it got repackaged for the American public, which was shameful what they had done. They'd stripped most of the content out of it. Um, but what a contrast to the 1970s exhibit that was organized almost like an altruistic educational event. Um, through, and the prohibition of special fees, government grants for educational programs, it was in those, the show in the 70s was intended to be seen by as many people as possible. Uh, the sh this show's arrival in the United States, <laughs> the New York Times greeted it by King Tut, set for second US tour, has new decree, money rules. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about this. Um, for example, the New York Times and art critics saw the exhibit as an ill-advised commercial enterprise in a cultural field that ought to be kept away from profit motives of any kind. It's easy to say, but it's difficult to run a museum. But you can see there are very different issues with for-profit shows and not-for-profit shows. And as I said, a glaring difference to me is things, the educational content that is missing from these shows. So the price paid for working with these exhibit packages is the museums lose their own voice over policies and even object selection. Uh, financial impact, the intermediary, the packager, takes much larger percentages, and their costs drive up tickets for the public. You know, now if we go to some of these big shows, it can be $45 to see these shows. And it's gotten, and of course the museums say, well, you pay $45 to go to a football game, or much, much more for a football game, but is, you know, so it's this thing, it's what we're getting at is actually the commodification of art and making it, selling it like it is a football game. So, and there's also more conflict of interest. Um, as I mentioned in the 1970s, Exxon was not selling oil at the Tutankhamen shows, but the, the National Geographic shows were there was a lot of conflict of interest. Most people are not aware. There are several different divisions of National Geo. One is the one we all love, the altruistic educational one, and then there are various for-profit arms of National Geographic. And so they were, for example, for this show, there was a spectacular catalog that was written in Germany with beautiful photography. Um, it had been translated in English, and because this show was circulated by National Geo, they would not allow that catalog be used and National Geo did their own catalog, which was very inferior. So problems with conflicts of interest with these shows too. So the point I wanna make is Tut does matter. It still matters. The king and the objects from his tomb, it continues to really be around us and shape aspects of our world. Yet we have the continued admiration for the spectacular art from this tomb. This is another motto pin. This spells his name again also, by the way. Uh, and it can, you know, Tutankhamun is used as memes for all sorts of crazy stuff. Here, Union Carbide selling uh, uh, buried cables using Tutankhamun. Or here, um, photographic paper, permanents, Tutankhamun. And it certainly has changed the way that museums operate with uh, the commodification of uh, Tutankhamun and other exhibits. So thank you very much. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu member.